right, looks like we got some folks joining us here. Hey, everyone. Um, we're going to give it a little bit of time uh, while we let let folks trickle in. It usually takes two or three minutes once you start these things to get everybody in the that's in the hopper through here. So uh, I see see the number of participants going up. So that means we're we're doing something right here. Good to see you all. Thanks for being here. All right, as folks trickle in here, thank you so much for joining. And then give it another minute or so for uh, for purposes of letting everybody everybody in the door, so to speak. I'm glad you all are here. All right. Sam, do you think we're at about right time? I'm looking for my my cues from you here. Yep. Yeah, you can go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Hey everyone. Um this is a really kind of exciting, exciting fall. It's an exciting moment for, for ranked choice voting. Uh as you all have probably heard us say, because it's our it's like our favorite fact at Fair Vote Dimension, which is ranked choice voting is the fastest growing election reform in the country. So we really appreciate you guys spending this time with us uh, to kind of you know talk more about this and, and keep the conversation going. And I think hear from some really kind of important voices that are making um, making some important history right now. Uh, this is our second webinar in a fall series of, of webinars. Uh, last month, we spoke to the folks in Evanston, Illinois. Um, <clears throat> it's a small town outside of Chicago. Uh, and we were learning about their efforts on the ground and in the ballot to bring ranked choice voting to Evanston. Um, if you are interested, you could find the previous webinar recordings on the Fair Vote YouTube channel, which eventually this will be uh, there as well. Uh, this year, uh, more jurisdictions are voting on uh, ranked choice voting on ballot measures than, than really ever before. Uh, today, we're gonna hear from, from our panelists, uh, Mike Alfani, Robbie Moreland, Saul Mora, uh, Lanise Shaw, and Evan Sinney. Uh, that are gearing up for election day 2022. Um, I know that's a hot topic in all sorts of circles, but it's uh, not not any less true in the ranked choice voting world. Um, we're gonna learn about these more about these campaigns. Um, we're mostly uh, talking about Fort Collins, Portland, Oregon, uh, and Clark County, Washington. Uh, we're gonna learn more about how the ballot measures work, bringing ranked choice voting to voters, kind of tips um, and 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 kind of tricks that folks have learned uh, on their in their advocacy effort along the way. And then uh, learning the kind of new opportunities to advocate for ranked choice voting um, at home and across the country. And I hope you 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 kind of take that and and think about ways in which we could kind of continue to expand this and continue to improve on this. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I want to in, encourage everyone here uh, who, who's joined uh, to be involved in the discussion. If you have questions uh, and you'd like to ask at any point, don't have to wait for anything special. Uh, use the Q and A function. Uh, should be at the bottom of your of your screen there in, in the in the zoom box uh, so please use the q a function we'll put uh questions to answer uh at the end of our program and our fair vote team will monitor these fields of this conversation so they can you know give you kind of rapid response as well so uh with all those kind of ground rules said and a, and a big uh you know thank you and welcome let me introduce our panelists uh <clears throat> first up is robbie moreland from from uh fort collins uh colorado i've gotten to know robbie over the over the year or so over there, she's got an MBA and a background in business development in the aerospace and defense industry. She's always had a strong interest in election and campaign finance reform, and is uh, the co-founder of Represent Fort Collins, kind of the part of the, the Represent Us network that's so inspiring. Um, and she's been active in advocating for election law reforms, 
um, an auditing candidate campaign finance filing since 2017, a nerdy but important job. Uh, and, and prior to that, she worked in various elements of elections in, in three different states, from voter data entry, uh, being an election judge and supervisor, um, and in her spare time between hikes and bike rides, very Colorado of you, Robbie, um, she races puppies for Freedom Service Dogs of America. There we go. Good shout out and guide dogs for the blind, uh, as if you weren't doing enough good things already. Um, Mike, tough act to follow, but uh, Mike Alfani has is, is been a longtime uh, reformer and, and, and friend in this space. He's the executive director and co-founder of Oregon Ranked Choice Voting. He's worked on ranked choice voting from coast to coast. Uh, and was an early adopter of RCV among campaign professionals. Uh, before working on democracy reform, he played a role in over 100 political campaigns, 20 of which were ballot measures, 19 of which passed. That's a good batting average. Um, these include managing the successful ranked choice voting campaign in Benton County, Oregon. Uh, outside of politics, Mike ran a business incubator and makerspace. In fact, if he goes off camera, you'll see a cool picture of him there. Uh, he consulted for Intel on the future of technology and help launch a movement to make public education more hands-on, creative, and equitable. Uh, when not winning democracy reforms, which is his uh, habit, uh, Mike is losing bike races and producing woodworking of questionable quality, he says. Um, so Mike, thank you for being here. Um, someone I've gotten to know through Mike uh, is Saul Mora. Saul, thank you for being here. She's the campaign manager of Portland United for Change, the coalition to pass measure 26 228 or uh Saul, you're gonna have to tell me how, how you guys like is it is it 228 or 228 i need to know all that um <clears throat> she was born in tijuana mexico and graduated from portland state university with a bachelor's degree in women's studies uh she's worked as a community organizer for several years with focus on creating more equitable government and democracy she's previously worked for statewide ballot measures and community engagement efforts like we count oregon the 2020 census campaign and currently she serves as the civic engagement coordinator at the Coalition of Communities of Color, uh, which is an alliance that uh, of culturally specific organizations working to address socioeconomic disparities and institutional racism. And I will say on top of all of that, Saul, uh, I have heard you described by several different people as a rising star in this reform community. So even, even more glad to have you here uh, than that. So thank you so much. Um, next up, uh, Evan, thank you so much for joining us. That's Evan Nelson uh, Sinney. Um, he has an MFA in creative writing from Colorado State University and runs a marketing copyright business. He taught at Colorado State for five years and lives in Fort Collins. He got involved with RCV for Fort Collins because he wants voters to be able to exercise their preferences more fully and hopes that ranked choice voting will help reduce polarization and strengthen our democracy. In his free time, he goes on, he likes going on runs with his uh, runs, uh, cooking and growing uh, hydroponic vegetables. Um, Evan, again, so Colorado of you. <laughs> uh, Lenise also uh, joining us from another way. Lenise is a retired financial professional. She has an MBA and a, and a former CPA with experience working in public accounting, large corps, small private businesses, and nonprofits. Uh, Lenise has been a supporter of Unite America, another great partner in the space, for several years and, and later started supporting Represent Us. Uh, she got involved in the RCV effort in Clark County, which uh, for those of you who don't know is in Washington state, um, after the ballot measure was already on the ballot. And uh, she's anxious that we need to use all the tools available to improve and strengthen our democracy. Uh, couldn't agree more, Denise. Uh, so let's get this going. Um, glad everyone's here with us. Let's begin by kind of chatting about the origins of your campaign. Uh, as we know, RCV can, be, can come to us and can become law in multiple ways. Uh, sometimes it's through a charter initiative. Sometimes it's because citizens bandied together and got it on the ballot. Sometimes it's because you talked politicians into doing it and putting it on the ballot. There's all sorts of different ways to to, to get this uh, forward and before voters and to, and to give them a chance to to do this. And I think, and for the audience members out there, I think this is really important because we need more of what, what you're seeing here. We need more of these. This is great it's a huge year but we to do more we've got to learn how we started so let me start there and let's begin in portland uh, saul can you tell us what went on down there or over there to, to get this going yeah thank you so much for this opportunity so measure 26 is a a city charter amendment. So in Portland, there is a process that happens every decade 
where a group of 20 Portlanders are appointed to an independent charter review commission. And so their responsibility is to go out and meet with the community, study the current structural government, and then decide what recommendations they would like to see. And so this year, that commission was formed in December of 2020. And through an 18 month long process of talking to community and looking at different alternatives, that independent commission referred this charter amendment to Portland voters, and now it is on the ballot. Ryan, you're on mute. Thank you for that. So I think it's so cool. I spoke to a law school class today, and none of them knew what a charter commission was. And yet that seems to be a very popular way to, to get us there, which is awesome. So uh, Mike, do you want to talk about Oregon as a state here? Sure. So the charter review and the statewide effort uh, sort of began independently at about the same time. Um, a long-standing interest in ranked choice voting myself uh, started just kind of making the rounds in the political circles, just finding advocates um, and just trying to spend about six months just having a lot of conversations, a lot of coffee meetings, just really just seeing if there was interest in the issue. Did people feel like it solved a problem and would there be a potential pathway for it to be enacted in Oregon. Um, and after a lot of conversations, uh, a lot of work with, uh, you know, labor unions, uh, the uh, uh, groups representing communities of color with politicians, with people who just know about politics, uh, it looked like there was an opportunity to kind of move the conversation forward. So we can be kind of started steamrolling from there and more formalizing, launching a website. Uh, but we did a lot of background sort of due diligence work to just make sure that like, what what was the way forward? Is there one? And generally, what kind of policy could be passed? Again, I'm muted. My gut on this mic is I'd be curious. I'll get better at this sometime. It's only been two years on the on the Zoom world. Um, is that and, and Saul? I'd be curious in your answer too. Um, the what's going on in Oregon, right? The the multi-member ranked choice voting, like there's a lot to that, right? That's not a that's and that's new for a lot of people, like really new for a lot of uh, people in America. If you talk to Australians, they're very used to this. But um, the Charter Review Commission seems like an interesting way to have a, a more full conversation about how to do these things better. Is it is it kind of open to be lobbying? Are you guys presenting there? Are you working both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes? Like how how does that work? Yeah, I'm happy to start answering this first, Mike. So in my role as the Civic Engagement Manager at the Coalition of Communities of Color, we were very fortunate that we were one of the community-based organizations that was selected to partner with the Charter Commission to engage community members in the process. They have had one of the most robust and inclusive community engagement processes that I've ever seen in the city of Portland. They partnered with 20 community-based organizations in total. And so across the span of 18 months, the Charter Commission truly did its due diligence of going out and just asking Portlanders, hey, what are the problems that you experience with the current form of government? And I think this this is really where a lot of people said that they didn't feel represented. We started to hear this growing echo of people feeling that our current voting system is not working for them. And that was one of the reasons that the Charter Commission then started to look at what different avenues were in front of them to increase participation in our democracy. So I would say that the way that people's voices were able to shape the policy of Measure 26228 was truly incredible. And it's the reason that this measure truly is going to work for the people because they helped to shape it. Anything to add to that, Mike? That was pretty good. I'm, I'm not even gonna attempt to add to that. <laughs> Yeah, so um, let's switch over to, to our, our friends in, in Fort Collins. Um, uh, the, the, ba the path there for you all was a little different. Um, can you explain that maybe, Robbie, Evan? It doesn't matter to me which one goes first. I'll take it. Um, so RCV was on the ballot in Fort Collins in 2011 and only garnered 40% of the vote then. And so now here we are, you know, in 2017, we started a Represent Us chapter and ranked choice voting was always on the menu. It was something we wanted to, to go after, but we didn't have a favorable city council for ballot referral. 
And we did research on the previous 20 years of our um, ballot initiatives in Fort Collins. The citizen initiatives um, passed about 30% of the time and the um, council referred initiatives passed 85% of the time. And so we decided to wait until we had um, a city council that was in favor of it. And so our job then for the next five years was to just keep in touch with city council, help the um, RCV loving candidates win. And then in April, 2021, we finally got a city council that liked ranked choice voting. And we spent a over a year talking to them, election code committee meetings and, um, and just talked them into referring it to the ballot, which they did. Talk about a long game. That's awesome, Robbie. Evan, any other perspective on that? No, I think uh, I think Robbie covered it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's so so important, Robbie. Like easy easy to get discouraged in this place when you don't see all the progress you want right away. The stick to itiveness, I think, is a is a lesson we all need to to take because we don't win everything. We're not all Mike Alfani. We don't win all, everything we we do there. No, um, and to know the history of your town, what what passes, what has a better chance of passing? Do the people, do the voters trust your city council referred measures, or do they prefer citizen initiatives? Yeah, no, I think that research is critical, and we've got a um, we've got a uh, partnership with the folks that rank the vote, uh, and a lot of and what, one of the things they developed is a tool, and we haven't fully kind of rolled this out, but it is an assessment tool for for folks like you know like Evan and and you, Robbie, like to go into your your town and say, hey, let's let's think through all the different parts because you know the fact that you did the research, you know, shows that. But you know, other folks may not be, at, you know, not, may not think about that off the top of mind about how to analyze that. So this is a tool to help do that. So we'll be, you know, of course, we're just trying to provide tools and, and resources for for folks to do this. Um, Lenise, y'all's path in Clark County uh, looked a little similar um, uh, to Portland. I know you became involved after that, so maybe you don't have a, a lot of like insight into that, but I'm curious what you knew about it. It was kind of in the ether. Obviously, you're someone who's involved in the community and cares about these issues because you're nerdy enough to be on this webinar with us. Um, what, what was your impression of, of how you guys got on the ballot? I'm really excited about the, the uh, charter amendment process that the county's been going through. And um, it's been a thoughtful process. It's improving representation. And the RCV is one of six items on the ballot measure, on the six separate ballot measures being voted on uh, this November. And um, so um, I, I think it's really good for this uh, community, the way that process has worked. It's also a small bite for us um, because it's only going to apply to county uh, nonpartisan positions. And so a, a lot of my conversations, people have been really hesitant. They don't fully understand it. And it's been nice to say, you know, these are nonpartisan positions. These are just six or seven roles. This is a chance for us to try this, become familiar with it. You know, it'll demystify a lot of it. And a lot of people are more comfortable with that incremental approach. Um, I'm disappointed that the Colombian has not endorsed it uh, and basically because they felt like it was going to be confusing, but um, but I feel like this was a really good approach for in implementing this here with the possibility of expanding it. Yeah, Lenise, I think that's right. I think, it, and especially if you take out the kind of everybody in this climate, unfortunately sees everything through red shirts or blue shirts, right? And and making it a nonpartisan thing, keeping it nonpartisan, often hard to do. Um, is, is super important. There's a, a question here that I think is, is, is worth asking if I can direct it back to our friends in, in Colorado, which is um, how can we support pro-reform elected officials like you all did? What was the kind of secret sauce to, to supporting that and, and ultimately kind of like low-key flipping the council, right? Like that's not, that's not insignificant to you all being where you are today. I'm sure the town itself, the voters that live here had something to do with that. You know, we we did get actively involved helping candidates run for office. We wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of postcards to people um, saying, vote in this person, they're you know, pro-election reform. And we built a huge database full of names of people who supported our effort. And I can tell you how we did that. And um, so it just is the long game. It really is. People who say, we want to get it on next year's ballot. I'm like, you're just now talking about it. It's going to be too soon, probably. 
Great. Well, let me pivot to another question here for, for the group. I'm curious about the, the kind of challenges you faced and take that as broadly as you want or whenever it is, but I think it's important uh, for folks to, to hear about kind of what are the biggest hurdles you faced in the campaign, uh, either kind of personally or, or as a campaign or as a policy. I think it's important to kind of get those on the table. So can we start with our, our Portland friends, uh, Saul, uh, Mike? I would say that one of our biggest hurdles has also become one of the things that has helped to garner the most support. So, you know, it goes both ways, definitely. But I would say that for Portland's context specifically, it has been because this specific reform is going to truly change our systems of governance, the way that we elect candidates with proportional representation being on the ballot. I do think there has been a lot of, at stake for changing the power dynamics and giving communities that traditionally have not had access to political power that avenue to elect the candidates that they want. So because we are changing those things, I would say that we've seen, you know, individuals from the old guard that have a stake in the current power structures that have come forward in opposition to the measure. But then on the flip side, I think it really helps to put it into perspective that we also have one of the largest coalitions supporting a local ballot initiative in Portland. You know, we have civic groups like the League of Women Voters, the Portland NAACP chapter, labor unions, small business owners. It has been wonderful to also compare it to this large coalition of over 100 supporters that are in favor of the measure. So I would say in some ways it has worked to our advantage. And I think that voters are able to see, you know, why those people opposed are opposed. Yeah, so I always think about that as like the whatever system got them elected in the first place must be the fairest and truest system in the in the land because it elected them, right? And so changing that is uh is changing changes the game. Mike, what would have been the hurdles you you you've seen out there? Um, I know you've I seen a few. I, I've seen, we've seen a few. We've also been really lucky in many ways. Um, and, and there's two. The, the first one I think is simple. Uh, and I'm going to say that I fell into the trap of both of these on the wrong side and was able to learn, I, I hope. But the first one was patience. I think that uh, it's already been mentioned multiple times. It's like being like, we're going to change the whole system this year. It's just not going to happen at all, ever, almost anywhere. It, it's This is a long run. Like the ballot initiative strategy center estimates it takes about six years to go from concept to actually winning a ballot campaign. Um, it's not just getting on the ballot and then voting. It's, you know, you've got to do a lot of coalition work. We see all the time that people who just sort of like parachute in and try and put something, especially on a statewide ballot without doing their due diligence and doing the meetings and getting people comfortable. With the idea, those, those things win so infrequently when it's just like a let's get this done because they believe in the power of their idea but don't do the work to talk to people. Um, and I think, you know, we were hoping to go to the ballot in 20, uh, 22, we pulled the, we, we pulled back on that. It just was too soon. The education had been there. Um, and the other one, uh, you know, so I think we're on the right track with the 2024 strategy statewide. And part of that too, is that like, I think, you know, some people really want to work on just like the federal stuff, just the big picture stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I'm doing this personally. I started doing this because I'm like, oh, you know, America's a dumpster fire right now. We've got to fix it. So my initial attack into this was like, let's start at the top. Um, and uh, I, I'm just going to fully admit, uh, I didn't know uh, when the Charter Commission stuff was happening, you know, not not nearly as many people were involved at that point. It was sort of rumbling. And I was like, oh, no, it's a local campaign that's going to distract. They're going to run it poorly or they're going to, you know, they're going to shoot us in the foot for making the meaningful change on the statewide level. Now, uh, pretty much all of my organization's resources are dedicated to supporting Portland now because they're doing a, an excellent job. B, it's an incredible policy. C, we figured out a way to really sort of integrate, like, how does this huge coalition many of whom actually worked with us earlier on a 2021 RCB strategy in the legislature. So there was some sort of like training wheels almost for the big fight in Portland. Um, and then uh, we really built a much larger community together and it's going to dovetail really nicely into like a, a legislative session lobbying campaign this coming cycle. So I'm really excited about how it's come together in terms of like what could have been competing interests has instead become like a much larger, much stronger community of organizations that's very diverse uh, looking to do like a like you know, here's here's this year's plan, here's the next year's plan, here's the next year's plan. And it's really coalesced nicely through, I think, uh, the hard work of a lot of people like Seoul. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just really impressed with how it's all come together. It, it's impressive. I'm, I'm from afar, but I think you guys, you all could like write a book on this uh, and, and it would it would be a bestseller in the nerdy reform community in which we are in. 
Uh, let me ask our friends in, in Fort Collins, what biggest challenges, hurdles you guys have faced? Well, one thing that um, has been interesting is building a volunteer team and then uh, figuring out how to, to use that group most efficiently. And so we were at uh, farmer's markets for, for two years um, and uh, we gathered a thousand postcards from uh, people who were supporters and built um, a group of volunteers. And then a thing that I've noticed, you know, we're not that big a city, we're about 170,000. Um, and so we have this team uh, and we have to figure out um, what events we wanna hold. And I've been involved in planning and presenting at some events. And a thing that I've noticed is uh, that some have worked better than others. There'll be events where we have enough people to run a really good mock election. Um, there's a local brewery where we've done some and that's worked. And then we've had others where we've had, um, you know, I was at a board game uh, store recently and there were two people uh, and there were two of us. And so, um, you know, the person I was there with that night said to me, well, we talked to two people and so that makes it worth it. And I think that's a really nice sentiment, but I think um, something to consider is that every time volunteers are sent out, you know, for an hour and a half or two hours in the evening, they're not, you know, home making dinner, they're not spending time with their family and they might, you know, that it, to some degree, it's a zero sum game that they have a certain amount of time they can devote to this. Uh, and so I think a, a, a challenge, a, a takeaway that I've had from this process has been, I think it's more efficient to spend more time trying to find partners who can do some of that advertising for you uh, instead of running more events where you might only get two to five people. The brewery had a really good Instagram following, for example, and I think really trying to get in conversation with those folks and find partners who are excited about it and can pull in new people uh, that haven't heard about ranked choice voting is probably the most efficient path. It's really important, Evan. Though I think in this reform space, we always have to be prepared for the, we have a, a big a big meeting room and it's not very full every time. Sometimes it surprises you, but then it's not always. So, uh, Robbie, anything to add to that on, on the kind of challenges here? The reason we would really focus on volunteering is because when you're starting with two or three people, and you've got 160,000 people in town and you're like, how do you possibly grow and get a whole big database full of people that you can reach out to? How do you use two or three people to build all these coalitions that Saul was talking about? Get these coalitions going. I mean, it is, it can be a full-time job for all of you. And, mm -hmm. and you only have a certain amount of time in a day. And that's why you can't get this done in a few months. It takes a long time to build hu a huge momentum going. And so, by far building our team was really hard. And, and just this thing at the farmer's market and asking people to fill out a postcard in support. And we just collected these postcards in a box and carried them around to events and had people keep adding to our collection of postcards. Those weren't just to show city council their support for referral. Those were our database. <laughs> Those were our, our contacts. Those were our people we'd say, hey, anybody wanna volunteer? So it was super crucial to just meet people and give them something to do, have them fill out a postcard. It was a lot of fun, but it took a long time. It certainly does. And I think, I think you're right uh, there, Robbie, that you got to give folks something to grasp onto. And I'll mention, you all are all volunteer run. It's, it's a super impressive out, effort out there. And um, uh, one more thing related to oh, that, yeah. just, um, okay. just, just thinking about these local campaigns. I think that Robbie does an especially wonderful job of helping volunteers not get too burned out. Uh, and understanding that that like volunteers have different capacity. And so if people people might have more capacity for a while and then less and um, watching Robbie, I've been very impressed at the way that she's um, able to communicate with people and say, okay, you know, no problem. Why don't you scale back for a bit and come in when you're ready? And I think that that's an important skill to have from somebody in your group uh, just to keep people excited without getting them burned out. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, speaking of volunteering hardcore and and being engaged, Lenise, any what are the big hurdles you've, you've seen out there in Clark County uh, that you've either faced or that you think the kind of campaign faces? Um, Clark County is a pretty purple area. Um, we have some people who are extremely progressive and some people who are extremely conservative. And um, so there is some um, negative feedback on ranked choice voting that's ill-informed and there's a limited amount that we can do about that. Um, 
I think that the biggest hurdle we have dealt with, which was different from Seattle and probably different from Portland, is a lack of awareness of the ballot measure and a lack of understanding of ranked choice voting. So we spent a lot of time when we've been um, out there talking to people, just saying, are you aware that there's a ballot measure on this? Do you, are you familiar with ranked choice voting? You know, and a lot of times just asking them those questions and they'll say, well, you know, I've heard of it, but I don't really understand it. So a lot of our time has been spent on education. And um, I felt like if we could do everything over, one of the simple things I would probably do is create some small cards with QR codes that would take them right to one of those videos. You know, we have these fabulous videos on ranked choice voting that in a minute and a half explain what it is way better than I can ever do. And, you know, people can see that and go, yeah, there, I got it. And so some tools like that for communicating and educating would be really helpful. Um, I think what we had was pretty good, but I think that we could probably do better next time. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a time when I thought the QR codes were, were obsolete and then the pandemic hit and now they're everywhere and we're all very used to them. Uh, and I do think that's really good because people love a short little video. Um, let me do a quick little jump ball here from our, our questions here. I've seen, I see one that I don't think this applies to anybody on this call, but I do want to ask, um, uh, does anyone have any state election laws that have been interpreted as not accommodating ranked choice voting? Uh, if we had somebody from Michigan on here, I know there would be a, a, a discussion for sure. Uh, if so, how have you addressed this? Has anybody had that? Has anybody faced that? I wouldn't think so based on how you all got on the ballot. Okay. I just, Thought, thought I'd thought I'd ask there. I'll, I'll I'll keep reading through these to get there. But let me let me ask a um, another one on my list here. Uh, talking about building a local campaign, what was involved? How did you build and manage a coalition of volunteers and groups and stuff? And and Evan and Robbie, I think you all answered this a little bit. So let me go back to to Lindy's. How are you all building the the people out there in um, in in Clark County, um, and how, you know how are, how are you guys building it up? I know you have a, a little bit of support from from Fairville, Washington, but I know it's also a lot of volunteers doing a lot of good work out there. Yeah, this you'd have to turn to Fairville, Washington, on this because they are truly administering things. As I said, I'm just a worker bee. I've been pretty active, but I'm not I'm not coordinating volunteers or doing any of that <laughs> tough stuff. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I hope it's not raining all day when you're knocking doors. So <laughs> out that way. Um, great. Okay, well, uh, let me turn to, to our friends in Portland. Like, how'd you build this, right? Like, how do you get the coalition? Because you all have the coalition everybody wants to have, I think, for this. How, how the hell did you do it? I would say that one of the really unique things about this process is because it was that charter review process, right? We have known about the possibility of there being a recommendation on the ballot. And so we were able to work with so many organizations on the ground while the public engagement phase of the process was happening. And I think this really helped to make those organizations feel invested and passionate about the possibility of that final result because they were in conversations with their communities already. They were hearing from their people. This is something that we know we want to change in our government. We want more accountable representation, right? We want all of these different priorities. So I would say the benefit to a charter review process is that you are able to start building that coalition even before, you know, it's called a coalition. And then I would say that as we transition to the official campaign landscape, one of the things that we have really been trying to do is invest in capacity grants for our coalition partners. That is something that helps them activate their base, turn out their volunteers and communicate with the voters and community members that they are connected to. I feel like tapping into all the different communities that organizations represent that's the way that we get the word out. That's the way that we get more people to feel involved in these different efforts. And so for us setting aside funding for capacity grants for those organizations to do canvassing events and get the word out has truly helped us build out that coalition. It's so cool to see. Uh, seriously, write the book, please, y'all. Um, okay, uh, let me actually, uh, we'll, we'll stay in Portland here for a second, though I think everybody can, 
can talk through this for a little bit. Uh, how do you manage organized opposition to your campaign? Not everybody um, uh, agrees with us. They're wrong, obviously, but not everybody agrees with us. And sometimes there's organized opposition. You all have it in all locations. So um, let's let's start back in Portland. We'll work our way back through the through the country. I think one of the very first things that you need to remember, and this is really important for me as the campaign manager, as someone that volunteers and other people are looking towards, is to keep up that morale, right? Understand the positive merits of what's on the ballot and keep bringing it back to that positive message. The more that we get the word out about how this measure will tangibly impact people's lives, lead to better services, to better representation, that's really the heart of it all that keeps people feeling motivated. It's hard when you're seeing the opposition get so much earned media, right? There's a lot that you see that feels super frustrating, but at the end of the day, I keep coming back to, we know why we're doing this work. And I think that's something that often just gets glossed over when you're you know, in the middle of it feeling very overwhelmed and stressed. And so I would just say, keep your positive message and communicate that to voters. Because at the end of the day, the majority of voters probably won't know that there is an opposition, right? A lot of people don't even know that this measure is on the ballot. And so you have to take that step back and make sure that your communication strategy and everything you're doing is still highlighting that positive message with voters. I think it's a good point, Saul. It's hard in the campaign when you read every tweet and every Reddit comment and everything like that and to realize like nobody's paying attention to this stuff. They've got full lives to live and they're just going to hear just a tiny little bit stay, stay, staying on message. Mike, other thoughts to handling opposition out there? And, and yeah, and work? I, I, my, my best piece of advice is don't be opposed. Um, and I'd say that that's not always possible, but um, I know in Portland, I think we were this close, but there's just, you know, sometimes you just can't stop people from making bad decisions, but a lot of times you can. Um, from a statewide perspective, what we were, we've been trying to do is just ensure that anybody who might oppose this is more comfortable with it. So bringing a hard no, we're going to oppose this actively to like, well, we don't like it, but we're not going to do anything about it is a massive win for any election reform campaign. That may be as important, if not more important than getting a new coalition member is stopping a coalition from forming against you in the first place. And again, that takes a lot of listening, a lot of empathy, a lot of talking with people a lot of like being patient, uh, a lot of explaining things uh, and a lot of, you know, and I think essentially finding the right messenger is really important. Like I'm not always the best messenger to speak to a lot of groups and a lot of people, but it's like pounding your head against the wall to find that right person that can talk to the, you know, the chamber of commerce or the right person that can talk to the, the, you know, whatever political party establishment it might be opposed in your state um, and being really diligent about not writing off the concerns of the no people um, and bringing them to more neutral, at least. And I think that's 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 absolutely critical for any campaign, especially if they might put money up against you, because you're going to have to outspend them, you know, five to one to win or more um, if you are opposed many times. So doing doing the background work early on years in advance really pays off dividends on, on this end as well. Um, before I leave our friends in Portland, can y'all, uh, Tom from California asked uh, to tell us more about capacity grants. How much per org? What are the grants funding? Can you all sketch that out? I mean, you don't have to name names and, and tell tales too, but to the extent you can help shine some light on like, what does a capacity grant effectively mean? Absolutely. So a capacity grant is basically a amount of funding that allows a coalition partner, so an organization that endorsed the measure, to be able to be involved in the campaign, inform voters and their community members. And we know that because there are always so many different priorities affecting a lot of our organizations, sometimes it really is the difference of giving an organization some extra funding on whether they will be able to engage. So for us, it's it's really important to recognize everyone has different, you know, access to resources financially. And so if we do have the opportunity to, pro to provide that, that's definitely something that is a value. And so a field grant, for example, is basically funding for that organization to host door knocking events, phone banking, right, talking to voters and different activities like that. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that and being that's a strategy that we used in, in 2020 and 2019 as well when we were starting to build our the statewide coalition was like, uh, and I think you mentioned amounts. I mean, these can be ranging from $1,000 to participate in some events to that and send staff to things to like 
uh, Oregon Ranchers Voting Advocates, instead of hiring our own staff, we were putting out twenty to thirty thousand dollar capacity grants to organizations to join us, like dedicate you know half time staff members to lobbying on behalf. Um, you know, it's not like you're paying them to do this, but it's like you're paying them so they can do this because they want to do it in the first place. I think that needs to be really clear. But like a lot of community organizations have sway in your legislature, or in your city council, but a lot of them are also starved for funding and they're constantly getting asked to do things. Um, and it's the right thing to do. And frankly, a politically smart thing to do that if you're raising money, having your own in-house staff doesn't build long-term capacity for all your potential partner groups. You're a single use, single issue organization. It's important to fund like and be a part of the greater community. And the easiest way to do that is to provide resources to do the same work that you'd otherwise be paying internal staff to do. Um, and I think that's just a, that's a really, a really important model for people to consider. Thanks, Sean. I think that's, a, that's important for folks to think about. And I'll say from a from watching just the national funders, and I've been fundraising in this space now for, for six, seven years, uh, I think there's been a lot of maturity on the funder side about recognizing the need to do that. Uh, in fact, I've seen proposals where that wasn't built in. Maybe for some reason it wasn't needed or there wasn't an obvious grant partner or something like that. And one of the first questions I get is, from a funder was, why is there no regranting in there, right? What's that, why is it, where's the capacity grant line item? Hmm. Right. So I think that's that's a good thing uh, for us to have. But let's go back to the kind of how do you handle organized opposition? Let's go to our friends in, in Colorado. Uh, you all had some. It's very frustrating. I know we've talked about it, Robbie. What's going on? How do you handle it? Yeah, we knew from the beginning it was going to be the Chamber of Commerce because they came right out about a year and a half ago when we started about five months, actually, after we started working towards getting our CV out in people's minds. They came out with their statement against it. And so we knew they were there, we knew they were coming. And now how do we stop them from spending their normal hundred to $200,000 on a campaign against it? And so we actually went and presented to the Legislative Affairs Committee of the Chamber of Commerce. This is the group that will give the money to their 501C who's gonna go fight it. And so we presented to them our opposition, the main leader of our opposition was in the room <laughs> asking us questions, um, hearing all our talking points. Um, they had presented the week before to the same committee, the opposition had, and so we got to get in there and answer the questions, the misinformation, because we could tell from the questions that they're asking that they're like, so we heard if you only rank one, your ballot is immediately thrown out. So we were hearing this kind of stuff and we're like, no, 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 no. So we had to explain it. And what I've seen now that they have turned in three campaign finance reports so far, and we've turned in three finance campaigns campaign finance reports, is it appears that the chamber did not fund them. So the opposition, our 501c, they've only spent 25,000, which is a quarter or less what they normally spend to fight something. So I don't believe they've gotten any money. So they're still super active. They have their own separate funds from some other resource, but they're not doing near the fighting that we thought we were gonna see. And so they have yard signs, they're doing robotechs and calls, but, um, what they could have been doing was a lot worse. <laughs> so I'm pretty happy to see that. That's good, Robbie. I know this summer we were a little more anxious and uh, yep. it, you know, hard, hard, to, hard to know what they're gonna do. And we face that everywhere. Uh, Lanice, you all, you all have had uh, some opposition in Clark County. You've had some good support, but you've had some opposition. How are you handling that as you're a volunteer, knocking doors, talking to folks, um, or, or, or does it even come up? Cause it's, you know, it's everybody's busy. It's not coming up much. Uh, that I've seen, but um, we are starting to see signs, and I guess we're putting up signs now. I've just got a request to put some up, <laughs> so um, yes. we'll be putting up signs to oppose theirs, and um, anyway, that's about it at this point. It's not as organized as it sounds like it is in Colorado. You know, and I, I always feel like there's this time, and it happens about starting last week into this week in a campaign where um, you've already set your plans, you've built your budget, you've got, if you're doing mail, you've got your mail universe, you're doing digital, you've got your digital universe, you can tweak a few things, but you're kind of running the show, right? Like you settled on your messaging, you're not going to go reprint your signs. Um, and here and here we are, right? And, and thank you all for taking the time to be here. But I think it's an important moment to say, oh my gosh, now there's an editorial that came out that was quirky and not really as we would want it, or, oh, this group opposed us or whatever. And and you want to respond, but you're too close to election day to really respond. Yet election day is so damn far away, right? Like we want to know if we're going to win. And you're at this like midpoint of like this purgatory. You can't do anything. You're too close, but you're not close enough. And you just have to trust the September version of yourself 
that was looking at this calm, cool, and collectively, talking to good, smart partners and, and consultants, looking at your polling if you had it, and sticking to your message. And I think that's uh, it's, it's a hard time to be here. I, I hear that every campaign has been on mine. So, uh, so yeah. Um, let's, uh, let me um, switch and ask a question from the, the group here. I think uh, Luis uh, said, had something here. And I think this is interesting because there's a lot of really blue states where a lot of folks, I'm from a purple state. A lot of folks think uh, you all have it easy out there in Oregon that it's just a cakewalk to get democracy reform through, that Seattle and, and Washington state are just super blue and everything's hunky-dory and you just have to tell people about it and you're gonna win slam dunk. I know that's not true. Um, because I have talked to plenty of progressive uh, legislators and lawmakers, um, but any kind of tips or tricks and what's worked or what's not on California too. Uh, I think it's all easy, right? I don't know why you guys haven't already done this already. What, what's going on? Um, to talk to progressive lawmakers in a uh, our, about RCV in a progressive state, like how do, how do you make the case there? They're they're already in office, right? Aren't we doing well? Um, I, I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Since I'm, I'm doing the, probably the legislative one here, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think you need a couple things. Um, one, first of all, I'm just going to point out that Utah's legislature passed Oregon, uh, passed ranked choice voting before Oregon did. So, like, let's you know, let's not just assume progressive things are uh, progressive states are going to pass anything that uh, could be perceived as changing the power of those in office. Um, uh, and the 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 slightly less snarky but uh, also useful answer is um, I think again it comes down to you have to identify a problem that it solves right just being like no more vote splitting it's not really sufficient like I I've always found that our argument like wonky and it's a it's a why it solves a problem but it isn't the problem like it's not a problem statement that's compelling it's not a shared problem yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and especially if you're in office that doesn't really concern you because. Well, though you all in Oregon actually might be facing that so, with your governor's election, right? <laughs> yes, and we will have a problem, much like Maine had a problem where they electing people with 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 like thirty something percent and it going poorly. Um, we are having a three way race with a many many million dollar funded uh, third party or unaffiliated candidate uh, running into the sort of the center of the of the two major party candidates, and whoever wins is probably going to win with under forty percent of the vote. Um, so that's a good problem for us. But the problem that we approached this with was really through an equity lens. Like that was the that was from day one, like what we approached it with, which was like, this will elect more people of color, it'll elect more women, it'll elect more people from regular everyday working class backgrounds. Um, and it allows people to run without spoiling the election, um, because it allows people to run without spoiling the election, right? Um, and that's the message that we started with, and it was a really good one. Um, it's It has the added value of being true, and it was, I think, a good message to work with in the legislature, because a lot of these issues were being considered at the time. It was relevant to what people were talking about. So we, I think we, you know, we, our first round of lobbying campaign, our sort of training wheels run uh, through the legislature, I think that was really important. And the second, I'm going to go back to messengers. Like, you've got to build a coalition. You've got to find the right people. Assuming you're the right person to speak to every audience is is not a great strategy, especially especially if you're me. Um, so finding people that can validate, finding your champions that have credibility with the audiences that they need to talk to, like, I'm not going to send like a really left-wing organization to talk to a Republican state legislator. Like, I'm not going to send the Chamber of Commerce, not like they're ever going to support it, but like to talk to like a, a far left legislator. So I think it has less to do with like, are they progressive or are they not progressive? It's more like who's bringing the message and is it relevant to their interests? Are you solving a real problem for them or their constituents? And then who's telling them that it's doing that, right? Those are the those are the more interesting questions to me than like how do I approach progressives versus how do I approach conservatives? Because it turns out there's been success on both sides with ranked choice voting, um, and I think the Utah legislature may actually be the only legislature legislature in the country that's moved on it statewide of their own accord. Is that correct, Brian? Only 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 Republican legislature that has. There's others that have, uh, and the Republican Party in Virginia has adopted it heavily but only for their own party contest nomination processes. So not through the legislature yet, though I'm working on that. <laughs> um, uh, let me kind of give a, give a kind of a wrap question here. There's a couple of good questions in the chat. I encourage folks to keep putting them in there. We will uh, get to them one way or another, put some thoughts in there. And I appreciate the, the thoughts there, Susan and Mike. Um, but let me, let me ask this. I would love you to think about going back six months, a year, in Portland, you all were like starting this like 20 years ago, I think, um, uh, you know, whenever you were at the beginning phases of this and what advice would you give yourself 
from back then, right? What, 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 looking back, what would you tell yourself uh, to help to help kind of pave the way? I mean, this is a weird thing to do, right? It's not normal to give up your time and treasure and energy and resources to do something that does really good for democracy, but it's not an instant fix. It's not right in front of your face. It's long and it's abstract, even if it's equally or even more as important than something that might be. So um, let me start Let me start in Clark County. Uh, Lenise, what, what do you tell yourself? I don't know how many campaigns you've been involved with before, if this is even your, your first or if you're a, a pro at knocking doors and volunteering. Okay. Well, so what would you tell yourself at the beginning of this journey? Yeah, I, the only campaign I've ever been involved with was I co-chaired a bond campaign for the school district. Um, I think that right now, uh, given the democracy's challenges, this is the only way we can um, chip away at the failures that we're dealing with. So that's what I keep telling myself. Um, and I look at the Oregon uh, race and wonder about the governor's race and wish they had ranked choice voting right now. So those are my, I, I just think there, it's always a hindsight situation when you say, oh, I wish we had had it. And uh, we need to have it in place for the rare instance when it makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Robbie, Evan, what would you all go back and tell yourself at the beginning of this journey? I know it's been a, a long one here. I'd say chill out at all the things you can't get done that you're just pulling your hair out because you can't get them done. They're not going to be the thing that drives you off a cliff. You know, I'm always going to look back and say, we never could get our social media together. We just never could. We paid people. We asked, had volunteers. We did the whole spectrum and our social media still never came together. That's not going to be what tips it one way or the other. It just isn't. And so I could just relax about the things that used to stress me out. I mean, coalition building, what Saul is doing, it, it was like number one on our brain. And we just, we just had so many people to slam the door in our face. And it never even crossed my mind that I should be getting grants for them. <laughs> and that if I did, maybe they would have more support for us in, in the door knocking and the calling and stuff. So lessons learned is just more like, it was like, grab those lessons along the way and hang on to them because you're going to need them in the future. Yeah, which is why it's so important to do these, and, and I'm so glad you all were, were here to do it. Uh, uh, Evan, what would you would tell your, your past self about all of this? Well, I think, you know, it helped by the time I was involved, Robbie, I think over a number of years, had learned a bunch of those lessons and was able to tell me to relax, you know, a little bit because I would get confused or, or, you know, not sure how to express. You know, I do the communication stuff. Um, I think one thing maybe if I could go back that I might try to clarify earlier is what's the right audience, the right message for different audiences. Um, it took me a little while to adjust at different kinds of events to figure out um, maybe like like what Mike was saying earlier. Um, you, of course, you're not going to present this the same way to, to different people, even when we have been at events with the opposition. Uh, it has to be a different message. There's a lot of misinformation and intentional confusion. And I think taking the bait is a bad idea. Um, I think instead trying to keep a simple positive message is usually the right move. And so I guess from a communication standpoint, if I could go back, I would have tried to clarify that a, a bit earlier. I think that's great. Don't take the bait, right? Stick to your message. Tell people why it's good. Um, Mike, and then I'll, I'll wrap you with Saul on that. And I've got a couple of questions in the chat that I think we can knock out as well, but we're wrapping up here. So Mike, what's, what's the, what do you tell you? You're a pro, man. What do you, what would you, maybe you go back even further than just six months or a year. What do you tell your younger self about campaigns and these kind of measures? Um, you know, I, I like to tell the story of like how I kind of walked into this with the initial vision of running a traditional campaign. Like I was going to be a campaign manager. I would have staff. I'd raise money. Uh, I just hired my first staff like three months ago, I think after multiple years. Um, I'm, I'm kind of using this as again a lesson for folks, which is like the partnering with community organizations has not only been the way that we've moved this forward, like light years in the legislature, like we are, we have more support now in the legislature now already identified than we did halfway through the session last time. Um, and it, it's really empowered a lot of the organizations to run the campaign in Portland by doing a lot of the education work early and partnering with other groups on that, doing the re-grants. Um, I really wish I'd started with that mentality and not had to spend sort of six months figuring out like learning, but I guess, you know, you got to learn at some point, but it's been, it's been a ride for me coming from a very top down traditional hierarchical campaign background to work more in community. 
Uh, and I got to say, it's a much better model. And uh, it's been working a lot better just from a purely strategic standpoint as well. Um, so I wish I'd known that earlier, but uh, I'm glad I learned as much as I've learned so far when I did. That's awesome. Um, and uh, real quick on that before I go to you, Sol, uh, Mike, Tom has something in, in the chat that I think speaks to both you and I here very specifically, which is, I don't know, a bunch of election reform, reform nerds, generally whiter and older, uh, bring people of color and those focused on equity angle uh, that you guys talked about in a, in a, in a coalition. And, and, and I would love, if there's a short answer, I'd love for that. But I'd also love for just, I need to get you and Tom to, to, to chat because I think it's so important for California to do learn the lessons and, and replicate it the way that you all have there and, and Saul as well um, to, to talk about that. I don't know if there's anything you want to like tip your cap to, but. Uh, yeah, th there's there's two things here. One, I just this sort of funny irony that that question is being asked of me, the old sort of older whiter guy. Um, <laughs> and then two is that uh, I had to do a reframing of bringing people of color in. Um, it was all about giving up trying to maintain control of it. Like when we did our regrants, it wasn't only really just regranting to a lot of organizations that represented people of color. It was putting them in charge of the campaign and acting as a coalition partner ourselves. We did not lead our own coalition. We were not leading, we were not the people uh, speaking to the press. We are not the people that like are running everything separately. It's not just like put your name on the piece of paper and come do a little bit of work with us. It's like, do you want to own this, right? Like, and. We were lucky because we had I found a couple, you know, after months of conversations, found a couple advocates within those communities. But like, it's not just like empowering people to be involved. It's like you have to be willing to let the people most affected by these reforms lead the campaign. That's beautiful. Saul, any anything to add to that, and or uh, and or the kind of like telling the younger version of yourself uh, some advice. Yeah, I feel like this is such a perfect segue because Mike and I get to work together on a daily basis um, with Portland United for Change. And I feel like for me, one of the things that I would tell myself six months ago is just this like sense of reassurance that I know what I'm doing. This is my first time managing a ballot measure campaign. And so that was something that was extremely, extremely intimidating. However, I would love to just go back and tell myself, hey, you have so many multi-generational leaders around you who are going to mentor you and guide you along this pathway. And really, I think that's what makes this campaign so successful. We have so many dedicated individuals that are part of our leadership, you know, including our coalition partners and those that are doing the daily operative work on a day to day basis. And so I would really say, you know, as a lesson learned for other people, it's really important that you, you know, think through who gets to be a part of that leadership of the campaign and to offer opportunities for younger people and leaders of color and those that are doing it for the first time because these are skills that we're able to learn. And I feel like, you know, just reflecting, I'm like, okay, I'm a pro now, you know, I did it and I have just learned immensely. That's awesome. Um, uh, Kurt, maybe you and I could follow up separately. You've got a questions about Republicans. I work with a lot of them, work on telling the Virginia and Utah stories. We can, we can talk offline about that as, as well. Um, uh, so uh, yay, this is great, y'all. These are good, good tidbits of advice, good perspectives. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know it's crunch time. Maybe it's the like, let go and let God time. So like here, here it's a little easier, but um, I know everybody's excited for, for, for you all. Go knock those doors and make those calls and let us know how we can help. Please do, you know, at Fair Vote and whatever on your social media as you talk about this, we will um, put this out. Please, uh, if you joined us, thank you for nerding out with us for, for this hour and uh, keep an eye out for uh, an invitation to future webinars um, and touting our successes and learning uh, from, from this whole place. I really appreciate you all. Uh, and, and a special thanks to, to Sam from, from our Fair Vote team, Sam Terry, who's uh, kind of done the, the behind the scenes work here of making this all work together. So all we have to do is show up and chat. So uh, thank you for, for that, Sam. Uh, and I appreciate you all. Thank you so much.